The Aden Emergency, 1963-67, is another one of those forgotten conflicts that marked the end of the British Empire. Over 90 British servicemen were killed and 500 wounded in a four-year war that not only has been largely forgotten, but which Britain never really wanted to fight in the first place. It also brought to the fore a maverick British Army officer, Lieutenant Colonel Colin Mitchell, dubbed by the press Mad Mitch. I want to tell this story because my dad actually served in Aden, although just a little bit before the emergency, and was constantly humming the pipe tune, The Barren Rocks of Aden. It's time to find out a little bit more about the Aden emergency in the 1960s. The British had seized the port of Aden in what is now the country of Yemen in 1839. Interestingly, it was the very first addition to Queen Victoria's empire. When Captain Haynes landed his party of Royal Marines at the rocky port, little did he realise that it would be the Royal Marines who would be the last British troops to leave 120 years later. The port became an important coaling station for ships travelling to Britain's empire in India and beyond, and from the 1860s it gained further importance as a gateway to the Red Sea and the Suez Canal at the end of it. Aden was surrounded by a bare waste land of deserts and hills, inhabited by various tribes under hereditary rulers. Over time, the British signed agreements with these leaders and established protectorates, whose sole purpose was to act as a buffer zone between their port in Aden and the Ottoman Turks in Yemen. The port itself was actually ruled as part of the British Raj in India until 1937, when London took over direct control and Aden became a crown colony. By the 1950s, the Deepwater Harbour was the second busiest in the world after New York, with 5,000 vessels a year dropping anchor there. It also became a duty-free mecca for passenger liners. As the British Empire was being rolled back in places like India, strategic thinking centred on Britain's dependence on the oil reserves of the Middle East. Aden was seen as an ideal base from which the British could exercise military as well as political influence in the region. Consequently, a large RAF base was established, and in the early 1960s, thousands of British servicemen and their families were stationed in this sunny, peaceful and barren patch of Arabia. In many ways, these servicemen and their families were enjoying a lifestyle that many Brits now seek in places like Dubai and Oman. But even in this sleepy backwater of the British Empire, change was afoot. In 1956, Egyptian nationalist leader Gamal Nasser had succeeded in nationalising the Suez Canal and then humiliating both Britain and France during the Suez Crisis. I've made a video about the Suez Crisis and will post a link in the description below. Actually, I'll also add it as a link at the very end of this story. Overnight, Nasser became a hero in the Arab world, even down in sleepy Aden. Taking their lead from Nasser's Cairo radio, trade unions in Aden launched a series of strikes and riots demanding independence. Meanwhile, across the border in Yemen, a rebel army, the National Liberation Front, or NLF, was formed and supported by Nasser. The British decided to counter the rising nationalist sentiments by creating a friendly regime around their military base. In 1963, the various tribal leaders in the protectorates were persuaded to join the Crown Colony of Aden to form the Federation of South Arabia. With its own army and police, the Federation was promised independence from Britain in 1968 in return for a long-term lease on their military base, something akin to the agreements in Cyprus. At the end of the year, the NLF launched a grenade attack on the British High Commissioner, and whilst he escaped injury, 51 others weren't so lucky, one of them being killed, the rest injured. The following month, the Federal Government's Army, the South Arabian Army, SAA, moved into the Radfan region, about 60 miles north of Aden itself, to counter the growing NLF influence. Having reasserted control, the SAA then withdrew, only for the NLF to immediately sweep in again on their departure. Between April and May 1964, the SAA went in again, this time with the support of the regular British Army. Over the next few months, units from the Royal Scots, the Coldstream Guards, the Royal Anglians, the Parachute Regiment and 45 Commando were involved in several ferocious firefights with the NLF losing four of their number. Eventually, the Radfan area was subdued, but the NLF merely switched their insurgency towards the urban port of Aden instead, and a state of emergency, the Aden Emergency, was declared. Down in Aden, the NLF came up not just against the SAA and the British, 
but against a rival nationalist movement too. The Front for the Liberation of Occupied South Yemen, FLOSI, drew its strength from the trade unions in the port area. And whilst they and the NLF had a common agenda, getting rid of the British and the tribal sultans, their rivalry with each other would be fought out in the streets of Aden over the coming years, and cost a lot more lives than they lost to the British. In 1966, whilst this insurgency gathered pace, the British government conducted a review of military spending and priorities. Secretary of Defence Dennis Healy concluded that the British were in no position to exert any significant military power in the Middle East, and that therefore a military base in Aden was surplus to requirement. He boldly announced that when the Federation of South Arabia gained independence in two years' time, the British military forces would leave, saving the British taxpayer an estimated £20 million. So, from out of the blue, the British gave two years' notice that they were quitting Aden in its entirety. The federal government were aghast. They had all entered into the Federation, not least because the British military were going to be there to protect them against both the NLF and their neighbours post-independence. Meanwhile, the NLF and Flossie were delighted. The British were going and there was going to be no post-imperial base in their country. All they needed to do was make sure the British didn't have a change of mind and also undermine the federal government at the same time. Oh, as well as taking each other out. They stepped up their campaigns of violence. In December 1966, an Aden Airways DC-3 on an internal flight was blown up, killing all 30 people on board. In January 1967, riots by both sets of supporters broke out in the old Arab quarter of Aden. Built in the centre of an extinct volcano, the area was simply known as Crater. The local police rapidly lost control of the situation and the British High Commissioner ordered the British Army to be deployed. In the next six months, the British troops patrolling Crater faced 60 grenade or shooting attacks and returned fire on 40 occasions. They'd also be accused of heavy-handed tactics on the streets and torture of prisoners. And meanwhile, they in turn were taking more and more casualties in a conflict which their government had already acknowledged had no end goal, bar leaving the colony in the hands of a friendly government. On the 20th of June, 1967, the SAA in Crater mutinied and were rapidly followed by the local armed police. The police broke into their own armory and armed NLF supporters. Five insurgents positioned a machine gun in the minaret of a mosque and opened fire on a police car, killing both occupants. A British civil servant, Hugh Alexander, in a passing car was also killed in the crossfire. Now by chance, a Bedford truck carrying 19 soldiers from the Royal Corps of Transport happened to come down the road at that minute, and was shot up. Eight men inside were killed. Whilst an Arab NCO used the minaret's microphone to call on the remaining men to surrender, armoured cars from one parachute regiment suddenly arrived on the scene and got the survivors to safety. Meanwhile, four members of the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers had entered Crater from Marine Drive in a Saracen armoured car. The vehicle was hit and the officer, 20-year-old 2nd Lieutenant John Davies, ordered the men to bail out and run for cover. All four men were killed. Their bodies were mutilated and pulled through the streets and burned. In another attack, three members of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, who'd only just arrived in Aden, were also killed. And so the long day went on. A helicopter flying over a crater was shot down. Fusilier John Duffy was mentioned in dispatches for going back into the burning hulk to carry out both the pilot and his lance corporal. In total that day, 23 British soldiers together with that civilian were killed. Crater suddenly became a no-go zone for the British. And in one respect, why should the British care? The government in London had already determined that they would speed up their withdrawal and pull out by the end of the year. Why waste British lives? But one man was determined not to let the insurgents dictate the agenda, nor to allow the British lion to spend its last days in Aden cowering outside Crater. Enter Lieutenant Colonel Colin Campbell Mitchell commander of the newly arrived 1st Battalion of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. Despite their recent arrival, they had already lost three men in that attack on the 20th of June, and Mitchell was itching to have a go at the Arab fighters in Crater, who are now estimated to number about 400. His subsequent actions would become almost legendary. The Argyle and Sutherlands were a product of the 1881 Childers reforms, which brought together the 91st Regiment, Argyle Highlanders, and the 93rd Regiment of Foot, the Sutherland Highlanders, 
Both regiments had been formed at the end of the 18th century, during the wars with revolutionary France, and had served in some of the great battles fought by the British Army. New Orleans in the British-American War of 1812, Lucknow in the Indian Revolt of 1857, Ginginlodvu in the Zulu War, and most famously as part of that thin red line at the Battle of Balaclava during the Crimea. Mitchell himself was the son of Scottish parents, but had been brought up in Croydon, South London, where, at the age of 15, he joined the Home Guard in 1940. By 1943, he had enlisted in the Royal West Kents as a private, before being commissioned in the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders in 1944. He managed to see the tail end of the Italian campaign in World War II, before gaining a wealth of counter-insurgency experience after the war in Palestine, Cyprus, Kenya and Borneo. He was determined to use that experience to, well, if not reverse the British withdrawal from Aden, to at least do it with British heads held high. To that end, he actively lobbied to have his regiment sent to Aden. In fact, he was so keen to make an impact in Aden that he modelled their base back in the UK, on the key streets in Crata. And his lobbying paid off. They were posted to the southern tip of Arabia in the summer of 1967. And it so happened that their advance guard were there in the battle on the 20th of June. In the following two weeks, the rest of the battalion arrived, and as they did so, Mitchell organised nighttime reconnaissance missions to observe enemy dispositions in Crater. This included Mitchell personally driving his Land Rover into the no-go area. From these observations, he laid out a plan to reoccupy the rebel stronghold on the night of the 3rd of July. He codenamed the operation Stirling Castle in honour of their regimental HQ back in Scotland. As the red sun dropped over the western horizon on the 3rd of July 1967, darkness descended on Aden. The men of the Argyll and Sutherlands waited in anticipation for the signal to go. Alongside them, the Queen's Dragoon Guards had arrived to provide armoured support if needed. At 7.05 the radio crackled. We're moving! And then a strange sound came across the dark Arabian night. Bagpipes. Lieutenant Colonel Colin Mitchell was entering a rebel stronghold accompanied by Pipe Major Kenneth Robson playing the regimental charge, Money Musk. He was almost daring the NLF and Flossie to have a fight with him. As it was, they met no opposition. Earlier in the day, a Wessex helicopter had flown low across the Arabian Sea and landed the men of B Company from the Scottish Regiment on the Ras Marshag Peninsula. They would advance towards Mitchell's column in a pincer movement. And it was B Company who had inflicted the only casualty that night as an Arab fighter ran out of the cinema to challenge them. Reaching the Treasury Building in the centre of Crater, Mitchell's second in command, Major Nigel Crowe, stood in the middle of the street and negotiated in Arabic for the occupants to surrender, which they did. By 10pm, Mitchell had taken over the business and banking area and set up his HQ. All that remained in rebel hands was the HQ of the armed police. The morning of the 4th of July and the residents of Crater woke to find the British back in force. Mitchell's press officer now arrived with the British and world press in tow. The gentlemen of the press were greeted by six pipers playing Scotland the Brave from the roof of Mitchell's temporary headquarters. <laughs> it was a PR coup. Here was an operation that had cost not a single British casualty, commanded by a dashing officer who seemed to be acting more like a character from the previous century when the British Empire was being built, rather than when it was being disbanded. Stephen Harper from the Daily Express dubbed this new hero Mad Mitch, the man who tamed Crater. Mitchell became an instant celebrity, and in turn, other celebrities wanted to be near Mitchell. Comedian Tony Hancock arrived in Aden and visited Mad Mitch in Crater, followed by Harry Seacombe, who with great fanfare and hilarity, performed the opening ceremony of the new toilet for D Company. The press loved Mitchell's no-nonsense sense of counterinsurgency tactics. Basically, if the NLF or Flossie showed their heads, they'd be shot off. Those were Mitchell's own words. But others, not least in the military hierarchy, were alarmed by his cavalier tactics. On one occasion, a senior officer was horrified to see a box of 36 Mills grenades opened and primed, despite Mitchell not seeking authorization for their use. Nor were they happy about the way that he both courted the media and seemed to be lapping up the notoriety, especially when other regiments were also fighting the NLF elsewhere in Aden. Soon Mitchell was being brought into line. It started at the armed police HQ, 
When his ultimate commander, the general officer commanding Middle East land forces, General Philip Tower, arrived to lead the negotiations. Unlike Mitchell's bullish approach, Tower offered to work alongside the police to govern Crater going forward, and they would do so with no question of recrimination for the events of the 20th of June. Mitchell could hardly believe his ears. The men who had mutinied and then killed nearly two dozen British troops, including three of his own regiment, were to face no consequences for their actions. This is where military operations and high politics butt up against each other. It's ever the way. Towers was fully aware that the British government wanted to be out of Aden, not in 1968 as planned, but before the year was out. The political imperative was to get out of Aden with as few losses as humanly possible. He ordered Mitchell to throttle back in the interests of a political settlement. Despite the initial success in occupying Crater without any losses, the insurgency resumed in just a couple of weeks. Between then and the end of August, there were 91 attacks on Mitchell's troops. And in these hostile, nerve-jangling conditions, just like in a lot of urban counter-terrorism operations, his men were accused of overstepping the mark on more than one occasion, something he vehemently denied. Whilst Crater would never again become a no-go zone for the British, it was never really a safe zone either. As the summer drew to a close, the British started to fall back on Aden itself, in readiness for the enforced independence of the Federation. In the outlying districts, the SAA took over military affairs, but they'd been hopelessly infiltrated by NLF members. And those who weren't supporting the insurgents were looking to the new post-British world and could see where it was heading. Why fight a lost cause for the Federation? Across the former protectorates, Sultan after Sultan was toppled by armed NLF supporters. In Aden itself, Flossie fought an increasingly bitter street war with their nationalist rivals to become the post-colonial government. It was a battle in which the British were reduced to the role of spectators. I mean, they could have tried to control the situation, but what was the point? As General Tower later said, quote, How can you justify to a mother in, say, Yorkshire, that her son had been killed in inter-Arab fighting in a place that we were leaving a few weeks or even few days later. Unquote. Slowly, the British fell back towards the RAF base from where they'd be ultimately evacuated. Over the six months running up to November 1967, 30,000 military personnel were evacuated from Aden. It was a huge undertaking. A naval task force of 24 ships, including 12 warships, headed to Aden, on the 23rd of November 1967, the aircraft carrier HMS Albion dropped anchor off the port. She was joined by two further aircraft carriers, HMS Eagle and HMS Bulwark. Britain was ready to do anything to get her troops out. Meanwhile, Hercules C-130s were taking off every 30 minutes from the RAF base, carrying military personnel out to Bahrain and then on to the UK. And whilst Europeans venturing outside the diminishing British zone of control literally took their lives in their own hands, the evacuation itself was not hindered by either the NLF or Flossie, mainly because they were turning their weapons on each other. As November had progressed, it had become apparent that Flossie had never broken out of their Aden-centric trade union stronghold. The NLF controlled the interior, as well as the Federation Army and police. It was becoming very apparent who would govern the country once the British finally pulled out. And that end game was approaching fast. In the early afternoon on the 26th of November, the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders finally left Crater. During the previous 144 days, they had encountered 122 armed incidents. They'd lost two men killed to be added to the three dead on the 20th of June and 26 men wounded. In return, they'd killed 25 insurgents. Driving straight to the RAF base, they boarded their flights home, and just over 24 hours later, they were landing at RAF Lynham in Wiltshire. Lieutenant Colonel Colin Mitchell, Mad Mitch, was still a hero to many. However, there were a growing number of politicians and others questioning his tactics in Aden, not least fellow Scott and campaigning Labour MP Tam Diel. And his very use of the press and the way that he seemed to relish his maverick approach had not endeared him to the military hierarchy either. Many of them pointed out that whilst the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders found fame taking over Crater, there were many other military units putting their lives on the line in Aden at that time too, including 
the Lancashire Regiment, the South Wales Borderers, the Prince of Wales' own Yorkshire Regiment, the Parachute Regiment, and 45 Commando Royal Marines. It irked them that Mad Mitch got all the plaudits. He was told he wouldn't be promoted to colonel on his return. Nor would he be awarded the DSO, which he would have expected as a battalion commander. Within a year, he'd resigned his commission. He'd later embark on a short career as a Member of Parliament, before co-founding the Halo Trust, a charity that works to remove mines from previous conflict zones. Colin Mitchell died in 1996, age 71. Following the departure of Mitchell and his battalion on the 26th of November, the evacuation of the last forces in Aden sped up. Two days later, one para were evacuated. That left just 45 Commando Royal Marines and some Royal Engineers. At 3pm on the 29th of November 1967, the Royal Marines boarded WASP helicopters sent in from HMS Albion. Last aboard was their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Di Morgan. It was somewhat fitting that it was the Royal Marines who had landed to capture Aden in 1839, and it was the Royal Marines who were the last British forces out of the colony 128 years later. Half an hour later, with the Royal Marines safely aboard, HMS Albion weighed anchor and with a long blow on her horn, left the waters of Aden. Unlike almost every other former colony when the British left, there'd been no official handover to the incoming government. The NLF took over and established the Marxist state of South Yemen, allied to the Soviet Union. Eventually their regime fell and the country united with their northern neighbour to form one country of Yemen. Yemen now finds itself in a bitter civil war and humanitarian crisis. In many respects, I can't help thinking that the recent evacuation of NATO forces from Kabul has a lot of parallels with the Aden emergency. What about you? Britain locked in a war in a country they didn't want to be in, and which they couldn't get out fast enough. But would staying have been any better? I'll let you decide. But at the end of the day, what strategic or economic purpose did the port, let alone the wider country, offer Britain in a world where her influence and her ability to play policeman was declining? And how many more British servicemen's lives would such a policy have cost? As it was, the Aden emergency of 1964-67 to cost the lives of 90 servicemen dead and 510 men wounded. It's a little remembered colonial war. And yet, with so many British regiments involved, as well as RAF personnel and not forgetting those crews in the Royal Naval Task Force, there are probably a lot of friends and relatives of ours who were there at some time during the period. So, if nothing else, it's a story worth telling, just for them. Thanks for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed that story about the Aden emergency. I'd like to thank Norby Clark and other veterans for their input and photos. My next talk will take us back into the 19th century, as I look at General Sir Garnet Walsley's famous Ashanti Ring of Officers. Sign up to my newsletter so you don't miss it. Click in the link in the description. And don't forget to check out all my other videos. Do you know there's over a hundred of them on my channel now? Thanks for your support. Keep well, and I'll see you very soon. <laughs>